This is Megan Wall from Caracol Report speaking with Jamal Ademola, a mixed media artist, filmmaker, and actor working across film, visual art, video, drawing, painting, photography, and performance. You create around themes such as Black identity, the divine feminine, cultural consciousness, and society. So my first question is, what effects do you feel and see that art has on the current social climate in the United States? And do you feel African and African-American artists are being heard and recognized more in the mainstream media since George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, BLM, and more? Thank you for the introduction, uh, Megan. Um, beautiful questions. Um, I wanna start with the second one. Um, I, I do, I do feel like there's been a lot more attention on Black artists as of uh, 2020 um, with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Mart Arbery. Um, there was a heightened awareness uh, of, you know, like kind of racial injustice, a spotlight on that. Mm -hmm. So because of that, artists have been getting more opportunities to be heard and reflect like some of these um, injustices that are happening. I still feel like it, it does feel like a trend, you know, in, in a sense, um, and there's still a long way to go you know, for us to actually have more equity and, and equality. But, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's a good start to, to at least have um, more people paying attention and, and inquiring about um, what the lived experiences of, of another, another culture. Mm -hmm. Since you've grown up partially in Lagos, Nigeria, and then partially in Atlanta, Georgia, how do you find the reactions in either country in relation to your life? Yeah, thank you for that um, question. Um, for me, it's very personal and profound. So like I'm, I'm, my father's Nigerian, so I'm half Nigerian and my mother is black American. And um, I find that culturally, uh, I, I moved here when I was 10 years old and I've always felt like, you know, a bridge between two different cultures. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are all these, questions that my mother's side of the family has about my dad's side of the family and my and vice versa so uh there's this interesting um dynamic uh being in between those two worlds which is basically you know a way of like documenting and researching and documenting culture but typically like a, a ethnographer would try to remain um invisible okay as, as a document culture but um in auto ethnography, you kind of you're okay with your own subjectivity and and embedding yourself in that with your own experience. So, like, yeah, I'm currently in the in the beginning stages of um, you know, that's, that's part of like why I'm here at this residency is like you know writing and um, developing that idea mm -hmm. of uh, wanting to like you know interview family members and um, do more work in filming in Nigeria and in the States and kind of interview uh, across the diaspora uh, people about, you know, what they think about um, Black identity, you know, so interviewing Africans like, you know, about their per perception of, of Black Americans and then interviewing Black Americans about their perception about Africans. Mm -hmm. And, you know, through those questions, trying to find, you know, some create some sort of dialogue. So how often are you able to go back to Nigeria and what does it feel like when you go back? Oh, no, you're gonna put me to shame. <laughs> um, I haven't I haven't been back to Nigeria in a while. Okay. Um, anytime I have been back, and I and I do want to go more often, and I, I was, I'm actually hoping to make it this year, actually, um, in December. Uh, anytime I I do go back, I do feel, yeah, like you know, I I've spent a, a good amount of my time in the states now, so yeah, there there is this this cultural signifier where you, you, you're not, you're seen as American, you know, basically. So that, that's an interesting existence, you know, um, for my, my family members and, you know, that lived there to kind of perceive me as like, you know, they, they would say Yankee, you know, mm -hmm. that's the kind of like, uh, yeah. Or, oh, you're a Yankee now, you know? <laughs> um, and um, yeah, it's, as I've gotten older, I've, I've been really um, interested in, in making more work that explores identity. And um, that, that's something I, I, I really sort of delved into in the other film project that I've worked on, um, not just with uh, Nigerian artists, but also like artists from um, 
um, Angola or um, you know other other places in the continent. To, you know, because it, it's a common thread where African people are migrating and immigrating to Canada or England or the United States and um, still trying to retain their their Africanness and their 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 identity in a way and, and finding it to be uh, sometimes difficult. You know. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if you've heard about this recently, but Cambridge University's Jesus College is going to give back a um, Benin uh, bronze rooster to Nigeria. And uh, Germany, just this re weekend, said that they were also going to give back 1,100 artifacts as well that was stolen during the uh, 1897 expedition. Wow. Yeah, by the British. Yeah, so I've heard, I've heard a little, thank you for that. I've heard a little bit about the museums returning to bronzes, but yeah. long overdue. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's good. That's great. That's exciting. We need, we need that. We need to have the, you know, um, these spaces decolonized and um, have more de decolonial practices where, you know, you're giving back, you're, you're just recognizing, you know, whose land and whose culture that you are, taking and extracting from. I don't know if you're aware of the Netflix series, Sex Education. Someone just, I literally got a message about this uh, show last night. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't seen it, but like, I, it's on my radar. Okay, cool. So yeah. the reason I ask is this season in particular, there's a character, Eric Effiong, who is openly gay and he travels to Nigeria, mm -hmm. his mother's homeland where sex between men and sex between women is currently against the law. So do you think the television and film industry can or will make an impact on Nigerian culture in relation to LGBTQA plus acceptance? Um, yes, I do. And I, I think that's really important. Um, I, you know, it's a shame that um, that type of thinking is still prevalent where, um, you know, people's sexuality, they're not accepted for, you know, their, their own private lives. And any time that we're allowed to just humanize people um, and, and, and have more visibility, you know, that in itself humanizes people. You know, the, the more people you know, the more you see them, then you understand like, you know, they're human and, and it's not fair to like judge them or, or, you know, dehumanize them or critique them or, you know, continuously more visibility is always is always an amazing thing. Yeah. And then uh, moving into your own project. So you performed in the feature film Tencent Daisy that premiered August 2nd in New York City yeah. at the Urban World Film Festival. And it will be streaming at the 2021 American Black Film Festival in November. Uh, so what were influential yes, factors yes. that made you want to join this film? And uh, what kind of freedom do you feel working in all different mediums and not being restricted by one? Uh, beautiful questions. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, no, it was exciting. Um, this is my first feature film and um, I never I never aspired to, to act. And I, I apologize to my actor friends. <laughs> who were like, <laughs> I'm sure you were amazing. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, I, I had a I had a great time and I learned a lot. I met the director and um, I just I just liked them. You know, I, I liked him and what they were trying to do. They were trying to make a film outside the Hollywood studio system that was a like a an African folkloric drama fantasy film, um, which is just rare. Um, it's hard to get films like that financed, um, I think, because you know, in Hollywood, you know, you have to have a a marketable example of how is this film going to make money, you know, and if it hasn't really been done before, it's, it's just hard to, you know, find the, the investors for films like that. But um, this director, he, you know, was a commercials director from the Bay Area, um, had made a couple other feature films, I think. And um, yeah, I was I was happy to be happy to be a part of it. And to continue with art as well, I wanted to ask about the divine feminine and the divine masculine. You had mentioned that mm -hmm. you, when you work in art, you feel like you're able to get more in touch with the divine feminine. I'm just wondering like how that affects your art and how working with women affects your art and like how you feel you gain or change from that. I speculate, um, we're just at a pivotal time in human history. Like I, I think we're at a time where 
there's a lot of shifts in con consciousness and our culture and patriarchy and systems and you know just you know with this you know pandemic like questioning reality like what's what are we doing what's important you know what, what why are we choosing to do this you know why are we choosing to operate in the system or this paradigm and then you know we saw in the pandemic specifically how things that you never thought could happen like oh like things that you always told were impossible mm -hmm. we started to see happening you know like oh if you don't pay your rent you're gonna get evicted you know right and then now the government oh no let's let's lock lock down have a lockdown let's figure out a way to stave off evictions we, we never never would have thought that was possible you know and the way the way that incorporates the divine feminine to me is it's a gentler existence you know it's it's, it's a more humane like embodying the feminine to me is like um embodying um not only just nature, but but also nurturing. You know, where you're not you're not just this violent, aggressive, extractive system. You know, that's always trying to take from the land, take from people. You know, you know, making people slaves, dehumanizing people, like subjugating them, and just just recognizing that the oneness and and people. You know, in, in humanity and nature, that we're all connected. Mm -hmm. And and um, a world that um, operates from that modality is is one that would would uplift the the feminine, you know, or at least to to balance to balance it, mm -hmm. you know, to make to make it, you know, because I mean our, our history is dominated by I mean white men, right? You know, to be honest, you know, it's just it's just fact, you know, yeah. like in the last I don't know thousand years, you know. So like so now we're like we're we're dealing with the ramifications of of history and mm -hmm. you know it it has to change I mean you know the, the planet is is like kind of like grow, growling at us like this has to this has to change and I, and I think it's going to you know I, I can feel the shifts you know happening and with the such disparity in wealth I was wondering so the United States has a, a ton of money. Do you think that we should give more in, to Africa or should we not get involved in things? What's your opinion? Oh, I have some very, you got a lot of, you got time? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, well, like Malin's, like Malin's Bart Williams, amazing. Yeah, like she said, it's about an exchange, you know? Like Malin's does amazing work. She's a very inspiring woman. And in regards to Africa, the work she's doing, is incredible, and I, and I think and she made a comment about how you, you asked about giving more money, and yeah, we've seen that that doesn't really help. Right. You know, it's not helping. First, in my opinion, there has to be a reckoning of why Africa is the way it is in the first place. As far as you know, giving to to Africa, I don't I don't think just giving money. You know, there there needs to be a full on consciousness paradigm shift there as well in the thinking because right now there there's too much trauma you know in my homeland there is particularly in nigeria we're reeling we're reeling from the effects of colonialism in my opinion mm -hmm. you know there's a very um survival mentality where people don't care you know they're just you know they're just in a survivor's mode so you know there's a lot because of that there's a lot of um corruption mm -hmm. you know so you know you give you know the money people take the money and they they put it in offshore bank accounts you send their children to schools best schools in england you know and other, and other places so I, I don't think giving more money is the answer there, there needs to be more healing and, and, that, and that goes back to what we spoke on about the, the feminine aspect it's like how do we heal these communities so in an okay africa interview which highlighted your piece i forever am featured in the exhibit African ancient futures in Lagos, you said that you wanted to make something that was an affirmation because, quote, it felt like collectively in the Black and African consciousness or in the diaspora, the lived experience was always about oppression and struggle. How do you wish the media portrayed an accurate Black experience? And is the inaccuracy to show the totality of it what inspired this particular piece? That's a beautiful question. Thank you, Megan. To always be 
visualizing yourself and people that look like you mm -hmm. as subjugated and marginalized and dehumanized or in slaves or as, um, you know, it just, I, I ask myself, what does that do to your consciousness, your psychology, you know, to always, you know, to how for Hollywood to always want to make another um, slave, you know, TV show or movie, you know, uh, and, and this is, these are parts of history that are important to document and they've, they've happened, but you know, they're also uh, in the, in the timeline of human history, they're a fraction of the black and African experience, you know, that question was echoed by like me, you know, speculating like, well, what, you know, what was, uh, even the, even the art exhibit that I was a part of African ancient futures is that's the um, curatorial statement is like going through our ancestral history, um, like pre-colonial history, you know, going to a time before colonization, before, you know, um, slavery and, and all these, these different atrocities have happened, you know, and, and seeing yourself, seeing, seeing your, you know, yourself, your identity and, um, and understanding your power. So in I Forever Am, that was as an artist that was just me you know i animated a you know this this uh, character that i've been working on and i wrote a poem um and I, I just wanted to prompt it was like a prompt to like especially during george floyd where, you know I, I felt really i was affected by those images you know they were on tv of you know black black um men and women being shot and killed and um, yeah, you know, I just wanted to make something that, that that felt like, oh, we're we're more than this, you know. This this is not the only the only part of our existence, and and that was the intention. So, do you think Black Panther did so well because people are just want to they want to see something new, and also they're just so tired of seeing the slavery, Black oppression, and so do you think also with Black Panther now that it's been out that there's going to be more movies like that? That's a good question. I remember when Black Panther came out, I think that was 2018. I actually went to the set. Um, a good friend of mine named Lance Darden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he um, he was working on the film he, and it was shoot, shooting in Atlanta. I think to answer your question that, yeah, it did phenomenally well because absolutely like um, Black stories are human stories, you know, at the end of the day and they will travel overseas. And if it's a good film that has the marketing and support of Hollywood, you know, it will, it has a potential to do well, you know? And I think a lot of people had, it, we had never seen a world like that. You know, that Brian Coogley uh, had the opportunity to create, even though it's a Disney property. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that world appealed to a wide audience, you know, not just, not just black um, audiences, but, you know, worldwide and, I hope that you know we have more opportunities to tell stories like that. Um, and um, like Ten Cent Daisy, the film that premiered in um, New York, like that's a on a much smaller scale a film that was trying to make. You know, it's a it's a film about a um, uh, three sisters who leave the Caribbean to protect one of their youngest, who's a mermaid. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a, it's like a fantasy element to it, and. Um, yeah, just 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 films that that are outside the, you know, those the typical stereotypical stories that we we we've been we've been getting. You know, I'm I'm hoping yeah that I, I get to be a part or make more more things that are like that. You know, that would be that's like the dream. You know, to continuously yeah. tell stories that um inspire and and uplift and and at the end of the day, you know, let let audience know that all things are possible. You know, I love that. I have no other questions. I don't know if you have anything that you want to highlight, mention. Thank you, Megan. Uh, you know, you've been amazing. Uh, you know, thank you for your time and uh, reaching out to do this interview. Um, I, I love the work you did with Malance, you know, interviewing oh, her. You. So, you know, I'm looking forward to see more of what Carol Call Reports mm -hmm. put out. You know, I, I, I looked them up and, um, you know, it looks like they're doing a lot of uh, interesting reporting not just in Africa, but beyond. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm, you know, I'm curious to see how it grows and develops. Awesome, thank you so much. Oh, that, that made my day, thank you.
Cool. All right. Thank awesome. you. You too. Right, you too. Bye. <laughs> Bye.